Before I get into Church, Taiwan of 12 years and Little House on the Prairie, please, all together, I just moved to a new apartment. No, everything's unpacked. But hopefully with the acoustics, I'll be able to get more of the recordings out there and, and read more things online. And don't tell anybody, but this this flag behind me with that amazing logo is actually about white balance so that the computer doesn't think that my face is purple. So don't, don't tell anybody. All right. I, you know, this, I've, I've been seeing this and I've, I've just, I've, I've got this unction and I've got to say this now. Sunday morning, church, uh, do, do Christians need church? Uh, yes. Uh, but you know, with with the um, pandemic, pandemic or whatever, the, the 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 Chinese Wuhan, Bill Gates virus, whatever, whatever, with the thing going on in the world, um, a lot of people aren't going to church because that got all disrupted, and maybe they're going back, but but this whole question of how how do you how do you study the Bible, how do you meet with other Christians? Uh, it's, it's a question that I dealt with 12 years ago. And I, you know, I always say I live in the world of tomorrow. My slogan is today's news yesterday. And, you know, when I came to Taiwan, uh, it's what only 20% of the population in my area in the South is Christian. And they don't necessarily have the same values as I've said many places, they're filled with Confucianism, which is about uh, indirect communication, oftentimes non or anti-communication. Shame, can't apologize, can't forgive. And they preach it from the pulpit. They change the meaning of Jesus' words so that we do not apologize and forgive. And, and, and it's, it's like you can't really have strong, honest meaningful Christian fellowship with other people when they all want to do that. And I, I remember being in Hong Kong. I was in Taiwan at the McDonald's right near the, the, the station. And, and I overheard a uh, friend, Lily, nothing secretive, uh, an American talking with his Hong Kong friend about how uh, th th there was a, a Christian teaching ESL somewhere in Asia and there just weren't other Christians around and he was just starving for, for healthy friendships. And uh, that was me 12 years ago. And the, the, it's like in so much English American uh, Bible teaching, there's this thing that people say, and it seems that they say it without thinking. They, they say it like they're on autopilot. And if you love Jesus, you will read your Bible and go to church. And, and it's like, well, wait a minute. Um, I don't have that option. So therefore I don't love Jesus. And there's no provision, there's no room, there's no discussion about a very important fact. A little House on the Prairie, um, the Great Commission Jesus gave us to, to preach the good news to the whole world. The Great Commission's not fulfilled yet. It's not granted that there always will be a thriving, healthy local church near you that you can or should go to. And what happens if a virus breaks out and no one can go anyway? You don't love Jesus because you need to stay home? You know, what? where are, I, I, don't, I don't see a discussion about the, the exceptions. There's, there's going to be exceptions to things. So I'm over here in Taiwan. What, what I did for Christian fellowship was write every day. That, that's when I started writing. I was here and I had to have communication with people. And so I would write uh, daily logs. I would never skip a day. It was seven days a week. And I would write these to 30 good friends that I had at home. And it probably went on every single day for about three years. And out of that, uh, came from Asia with love.net. And I've got several books published on uh, for, for logs. Um, so I, I could talk more about that later, but writing was my outlet for Christian fellowship because 
I would hear some things from American friends at home, um, but at least I was communicating with people about my life and I wasn't all alone. I just, I needed that. But it wasn't Sunday morning. But according to what a lot of people say, I hate Jesus because I wasn't in a box with a cross on top of it every Sunday at 9 a.m. So I, I um, you know, our rigid systems are not enough to answer the world's problems. And, and being in the box under the cross on Sunday at 9 a.m. didn't help people when they weren't allowed to go because there was a disease everywhere. So, you know, one of the big reasons for the Sunday morning thing is to learn Bible. Well, thankfully, I have a bachelor's degree in the Bible. In fact, I've got so many credit hours in Bible, I could cut them in half, add math and science classes, and then have two bachelor's degrees in Bible because I went to Moody and it's, it's ridiculous amounts of, of, of Bible that we study. So I, I don't need to go to Sunday morning to learn how to understand the Bible. I mean, where does the pastor go to church? Who teaches him? Well, he went to a Bible school. It's called a seminary. Um, and like I say, when I was at Moody, I had seminary students sitting next to me in the classroom because my undergraduate professors were sometimes better than, than the seminary professors. So I've, I'm not exactly lacking for knowing how to read and understand the Bible and apply it to my life. But that's not normal for a lot of people. We do need to get a Bible education. Well, I've been in Taiwan and, and, and pe people ask me, uh, Enoch Olson, founder of Spring Hill Camps, should have heard of it, hopefully, largest camp in North America. He asked me early on, Jesse, Jesse, I want you, tell me, what, what are you doing for the gospel in Taiwan? And I said, I'm staying out of the way because it in and I'm, I'm going to tell you something else that's happening, but this was early on, 12 years ago. Missionaries would come to Taiwan. They would teach their denominationalism. They'd get like four or five Taiwanese to become Christian and follow them. And then the and then the the American Western missionary would would tell those Taiwanese Christians that every other local church is wrong and only they're right. And so there's there's an enormous amount of fragmentation and fighting among these little tiny foreign missionary founded local churches and they don't grow. They're, they're ultra small and they don't grow and they disagree with a lot of people. They do a lot of fighting. Um, but then you've got established uh, Chinese churches led by uh, Taiwanese pastors and they're teaching anti-forgiveness. And there's a lot of fighting and division and the pastors talk to each other, but it's kind of a territorial guild in a sense for how it works. Well, that's very different from Hong Kong. Well, Hong Kong, on, on a regular basis, has these monthly or annual region-wide Sunday morning celebrations. It's, it's a very normal thing. It's like, okay, well, oh, this next month, we're, we're all, everybody in this district is all meeting out on that sports field for church. And it, it's very normal for the, the local churches in Hong Kong to, to join hands and work together and, and even share church members. It's, it, they really work together. There's a lot of unity in Hong Kong. It is a very different scene, the local church scene in Hong Kong versus Taiwan. Um, and it, it's... So I, I did not want to be one of those divisive missionaries making a mess. I've been in Taiwan, you know, 12 years ago. It was just a few weeks, less than a year. I don't know what's going on. I don't, I don't know the setting. I'm not going to be presumptuous and teach everyone to do things the white way. So I just, I just kept growing in Jesus and learned how to love more and tried to understand the culture. In a sense, it was kind of like the e Tao video. You spend the first, the first thing a missionary has got to do is learn the language. So I, um, it, which, which I did. Uh, my Chinese is better than a lot of Americans uh, because I focused on phonics, which is an education question that, that, that gets into all kinds of other topics. But I went through those things and and as I would read the Bible, after a few years, I was literally reading the book of Revelation every day. And uh, that led me to translating the book of Revelation. So I was doing Bible work on my own in Taiwan. And then friends started coming to me 
telling me that they want to become Christian and believe in Jesus and they wanted to know what to do. I do not go up to people and ask them to believe in Jesus. I've never done that in Taiwan. I have told people that I believe in Jesus and I have told people that Jesus loves them and wants them to know that somehow. But I I just, I, I deliver that message and love people. And it's not something I'm saying all the time like a broken record either. I, I tell people about my love for them with my actions as much as I can. So people come to me and ask it, how they can become Christian. People come to me and ask to be baptized. One, one kid believed Jesus, but he kept having anxiety issues. And he's like, maybe I should be baptized. I really think I should. I'm like, well, okay. He's like, but I can't be baptized. Uh, we're outside. I'm like, well, th th there's an empty tub. Uh, let's just fill it up with water. And one kid, th this kid, I baptized him at 10 o'clock at night on the sidewalk with the large wash tub we, we saw that was empty. We filled up with water, baptized him, and turned it back upside down, and it was all dry in the morning. And that was how I was baptized. His life changed. I, you know, maybe you've heard of getting baptized can change stuff. He asked me for that. All right, well, as people come to me and ask me stuff, someone came to me and asked me to read um, the, the Max Licato, uh, Uncle Arthur, not, not Max Licato, um, uh, Arthur Maxwell, excuse me. Although Max Licato also, um, someone asked me to read the Uncle Arthur st Bible stories. And so I did. And then we got to reading Bible. We read the book of Genesis, eight, nine-year-old, 10-year-old kids. I read the entire book of Genesis and then through Exodus, through the Ten Commandments, and then into Joshua and maybe Judges, and uh, it and and I we just we read it, and these kids tell me, I believe Jesus. I'm like, well, okay, all right. Well, what do I do? I'm like, well, you've got to love your brother, and you've got to respect your your mom and dad. You know, your mom is crazy. Do you know why? There, there's two reasons your mom is crazy: the older brother and the younger brother. Without you two, your mom wouldn't be crazy. So you got to forgive her because she forgives you. Oh, so the kids learn. Um, there's a kid over here that might have antisocial tendency. Um, and uh, he fits the bill. One of my Bible professors at Moody did research on how to treat people with antisocial tendency. I read that section of his book and I used it. And the kid is developing a conscience. He doesn't lie. He's learning to love. And he is possibly a high-functioning psychopath who loves Jesus. It's amazing. And they came to me. Well, now we've, we've read so much Bible that they're like, I want to read something else also. So we're reading Little House on the Prairie. And, and so I'm, I'm in this Little House on the Prairie series. And, you know, I, 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 I'm now hearing people in America still talking well, if you love Jesus, you have to read the Bible and go to church. That's just, that's minimum. I'm like, um, what church did Laura Ingalls Wilder go to when she was with her father, Charles Ingalls, and and you know, Ma and Pa, Little House on the Prairie. They they didn't have a church to go to. The, their church what was Mr. Edwards, and and Mr. and Mrs. Scott. And that was it. And they'd see him once in a while. And that was it. Now, now was that valid church? Now, Laura's father insisted that if Indians came to the house and demanded stuff, that you always give it to them. He said, we don't need to be fighting with the Indians. We've got to get along. So, you know, they were smart and they locked away most of their food, but they'd have some food set out for the Indians to come in and steal. And because and, they wanted peace. That, that's very Jesus. If someone, you know, wants something, give it to him. And, um, you know, Mr. Scott helped them dig their well. You know, didn't do it right, almost died because of, 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 of low-lying settling gases. And uh, Pa saved his life, brought him up out. Mr. Edwards uh, brought some presents for the girls and, and swam across the cold river at Christmas because he had to bring the presents to the girls. That's love. 
and they had local friends uh, when when they were you know, pioneers on the prairie. Now, that sounds to me like meaningful Christian fellowship. Christian fellowship is not somehow better if it's in a box with a cross on top. And, and later on, toward the end of the book, Little House on the Prairie, the local Indian tribes had decided to go through and commit genocide and kill all the white settlers. And at the last minute, this other Indian tribe came in and said, you make war with the white man, you make war with us. And there was a lot of screaming and shouting and eventually the, the tribes dispersed and decided not to do the genocide. Now, what would have happened was they would have killed a few hundred settlers at most, and then the American government would have gone in and killed thousands of Indians. And all of that was saved because one tribe decided that some of the white settlers didn't need to be killed. And, and the biggest champion of the Indians, I mean, even the Scots thought that the only good Indian was a dead Indian. Now, that's in the book. Um, even Ma had her doubts. She, she didn't, these Indians scared her, but Pa kept saying, be patient and love. That sounds to me like people that love Jesus and know how to love others. And, and in, in the end, uh, you know, Charles Ingalls love Pa, he, he probably saved a lot of Indians from, from dying from a war with the American government. Um, they didn't have a local church. And although arguably their, their neighbors were, and the Indians uh, were their, their assignment, let's say, um, make friends with these people. And Pa did. Um, when people say, you've got, you have to go to church. Like, no, you've got to be the church. And the Sunday morning box with the cross on top can help and facilitate a lot of things. It can, but it's not the only way. And we talk as if it is the only way. And that's where I've got trouble. I, that, I disagree with that. We've got to think outside the box. The Chosen TV series, you know, so, so often you've, you, you've got Nicodemus talking to Shmuel. What if God does something that's not the way we do it? I want to be open for God to do new things. Can we agree on that? Or Jesus talking to Peter about uh, inviting a tax collector to join them. Get used to different. God never changes, but, but what he does with us always changes because we're always changing as we grow up and grow old. So I'm always open to God doing new things and and. Taiwan has let me live in that. Many Americans come to Taiwan, they get frustrated, they, they don't make it work, they run out of money and they got to go home angry. I managed to stay because I already learned to think outside the box, but now I'm thinking even more outside the box. So the local Christians that come talk to me, you know, one of them, his aunt led him to Jesus and then took him to church. He didn't like that because it was too controlling and they taught against forgiveness, and which is almost... 100, I believe it's 100% universal in Taiwan. If there's, if there's a, a healthy church that teaches against teaching against forgiveness in Taiwan, I will celebrate and give a 21-gun salute. But I, I, I can't imagine how they, they'd survive in the, in, in the economy because I don't think that Taiwanese would, would, would make donations to them because this is something that Taiwan's culture hasn't yet learned. The young people are learning it. The young people in Taiwan want forgiveness, but churches don't accept them because they're run by the older generation. So there are all these Christians in Taiwan that are young people in their 20s and they can't go to church because they're scorned and shamed because they want to believe in forgiveness. Now, who's going to work with them? If I go run around and say, you have to go to church, for them, that means they have to go hear about how forgiveness is evil because they have Confucius teaching. Confucius philosophy was obey without question. If you ask why it's rebellion, this is respect. Forgiveness is impossible, so don't even try it. That's what Confucianism is. He's not some great wise philosopher. He was a fool who said a few things that we in the West quote without really knowing what his main thesis was. And the, that Confucianism is far more influential in China's government than the communism is. And that Chinese communist government is fighting against the government of Taiwan, the, the old government they rebelled against which is slowly learning forgiveness and freedom. 
And we're in the middle of that war between China and Taiwan. And the young people don't want to have that old way of thinking that dominates and refuses to forgive or ask why or explain why. So these young people come to me. They say, even Royu, I talk about Royu. He called me at 11 o'clock at night one night. I think God wants me to become a Christian because the internet shut off and now I've got to go to bed on time. God's making me a better person. I think I want to become a Christian. And so I've been teaching in Bible. Um, there, there's another Christian who came to me. Um, he, uh, he grew up at an orphanage right near my first apartment, like literally directly next door for five years. I, we lived next to each other and never talked to each other. And then later on, he was 17. I met him on the street one night just being friendly and, and we're friends. This kid is an amazing Christian. But he, he doesn't want to go to church because he likes the idea of forgiveness. So you can't go to church in Taiwan. Or you'll hear about how forgiveness is evil because you'll get Confucius from the pulpit. Well, the Christians here, what we do in church, we're in communication all week long. Sometimes we go months without talking to each other because we're busy. And then we get back together. We'll talk for like three days in a row, all day long. And, and we're studying Bible. We're praying for each other. Someone needs something. We're there. I, 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 you know, th this guy helped me find my new place. This is one guy. We, we work and help to get, you know, I, <laughs> in America, Christians help each other build their houses and, and do roofing projects. In Taiwan, it's finding a new apartment or helping mo someone move. And, you know, one of the things that we pray for is the weather. A lot of us are very athletic. And by training our physical bodies, we learn what it's like to grow up spiritually. When, when, when you're exercising as an athlete, you're constantly injuring yourself. You've always got a sprained ankle or, a, or a, some tendonitis developing in your elbow. And, and a lot of the gym exercises for a serious athlete are fixing the problems that are always going to show up when you get stronger. It's, it's not just pain from muscle growth. It's the injuries in the process you're constantly healing and icing. And, and as we do that, the hard knocks of life are much easier to deal with. So one of the big ways that we pursue God is to strengthen our bodies for sports or bodybuilding or whatever. And that also means getting up early, self-discipline. So interestingly, sports and physical exercise is a big part of our walk with Jesus. And as part of that, I'm, I'm, I'm working with, with skateboarders that have been selected by Taiwan's government to be athletes in the Olympics. And I would not be sharing Bible, Jesus, and praying with them if my Christianity was limited to Sunday morning because I wouldn't have been there, not at the right place. So I'm talking to, talking to people in government offices about Jesus only because I do not go to Sunday morning church. And the reason I didn't is because I refuse to be at a place that teaches against forgiveness actively. And, and, and they literally will take disciplinary steps against you in Taiwan if you try to reach out in forgiveness and friendship and apologies. I've gone to people and tried to apologize and... and, and Two, two different local churches, the two largest in my city, held large meetings talking about my problems without me because I tried to talk to people to apologize for offending someone when I didn't know it. And their friends in America, of course, never helped. And I, so I'm, I'm not going to be part of that. And because I stuck with that, now I'm sharing Jesus with Olympic athletes and government officials. Now chew on that. <laughs> And as we Christians talk with each other, one of the things that we're praying for is weather. Because skateboarders have to skate. You cannot skate in the rain. The bearings get wet and rusty and you're done. And that's 30 bucks in an economy where uh, people get paid $5 an hour, maybe $3 an hour. At, you know, at most because the cost of living. Um, 
we pray for weather. And so we got to have rain. At, seriously, like, like praying for weather is on the list of things to do. Yeah, well, we need rain. The water levels are low. They're going to tell everyone to shut off the water because we need rain. So, but we got to skate in the afternoon. So let, let's pray for rain in the morning. Like we have these discussions and it happens. You know, life works together. We see God moving among us. We, we've got to have a meeting in, in prayer time at the skate park on Monday at three o'clock or whatever. And, and the storm clouds start developing. Well, while everyone's on the way there, we all, we get there, we find out everyone was praying for a clear sky on the way and, and, and the clouds went away and, and, and it didn't rain, even though it was forecasted to. This is our normal. This is our Christian fellowship. Are we a valid church? We're doing the work and business of church, Bible education, prayer, helping each other, learning to grow in love and growing closer to God as God works through us in our daily lives. Uh, you know, doing the normal routine, washing the dishes, cleaning the clothes, taking the kids to school and continuing normal exercise and doing justice and fearing and loving God all along the way. And we're doing that not just one day a week, not just inside a box with a cross on top. We're doing that everywhere, every time, every moment. And we're doing it with the clouds. And, and this, is, this is something that I think China might not understand. The most dangerous weapons in Taiwan are not any awesome, wonderful missile that America sold to Taiwan for strong and wise defense, just like, just like Israel also has strong and wise defenses. David was a king. Israel trained for war in the desert 40 years. Strength is brilliant as long as you're not bullying others. But those are not the most dangerous weapons in Taiwan. The most dangerous weapons in Taiwan are Christians who don't go to church because they love Jesus who are able to pray for weather. From Taiwan, with much love.